At this time, I would like to turn today's program over to Canada Health and Foe. The floor is yours. Thank you, Monique. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fraser Rochford. I'm a group program director here at Canada Health and Foe, and I get the pleasure of running a lot of these challenges. So welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, first of all, we'd like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. Um, and so, and it will be posted on our uh, site uh, after this uh, presentation. And uh, as Monique explained, please use the Q&A feature to ask any questions as your telephone lines are muted. Here's a little quick disclaimer. Uh, we do have some, uh, a guest that's also presenting this afternoon, and uh, one of my colleagues will be introducing her in the, uh, in the upcoming uh, few minutes. Uh, but just wanted to let you realize this disclaimer. Um, as Monique suggested, uh, here's a little visual so you can see where you can ask Q&A. Make sure you direct your Q&A to all panelists, um, and then we'll uh, queue up your questions at the end of the webinar. But don't hesitate to start typing your questions in as you hear each of our um, speakers uh, talking, So, uh, and then we'll get them all lined up at the end. We do have an hour, um, but uh, if, if we end quicker because it's a beautiful Friday afternoon, uh, we will do so. Um, but we're here to answer all of your questions. So for those of you who uh, haven't participated in uh, one of these webinars before, just a quick little uh, overview of Canada Health InfoWay. Our vision is healthier Canadians through innovative digital solutions. And we do this with our partners, um, jurisdictional partners, other partners such as our supporting organizations of this channel, uh, of this challenge to help accelerate the development, adoption, and effective use of digital solutions across Canada. Um, our imagination challenges are part of our consumer health and innovation programs here at InfoA. And as you can see, the challenges seek to inspire, provoke, and promote innovation in health and healthcare and to foster a community of innovators. It's, we have created this community of innovators, and we're pleased to see this community continue to expand with the participation and interest in this data impact challenge. Um, while each of the challenges that we have run are different, they all have the same goal. And we first started launching our challenges in 2011, where our first challenge was asking uh, people to give us their best idea to improve healthcare. And since then, we've done other challenges to uh, uh, measure the impact of digital health in Canada, and we're very excited to have this particular data impact challenge as well. These challenges would not be possible without our supporting organizations who lend us their expertise and support uh, throughout the challenges. We're pleased to see them listed here. There's 18 of them at the moment. Um, and um, we're very happy for their continued support. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Simon Hagen. Thanks very much, Fraser, and welcome, everyone. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about the challenge, uh, provide a bit of an update, and then I'm going to hand it over to our guest for today. But just to start, as a refresher for those who uh, aren't familiar with the Data Impact Challenge, this was a, a challenge that emerged from some of the, the tough questions um, uh, we were seeing in some of our evaluation activities we were, we were challenged to find answers to. And so we thought an opportunity to put a, a, a set of questions out to some of our partners in the research community and who are involved in data analysis to see if they are able to source answers to these questions um, and really test the feasibility of a mechanism for matching organizations that have data um, and, and can provide analysis with, with those people out there that need answers for, uh, policies and, for policy and decision making. So I'll give you a little bit of an update so far on our progress. Really, really excited about the interest that we're seeing. So we're seeing lots of great registrations. We're seeing a real diversity of participants from, from across the country and from different kinds of organizations. Um, we're seeing uh, uh, the, the submissions uh, start to trickle in, which is really exciting. Uh, I do want to stress that we have lots of those speed points 
uh, still remaining. So, uh, so while, while we've seen some submissions, many of those top speed, speed points are still available. So I'd encourage folks to get in there and make their submissions soon to snap up those speed points. Um, the, the only question where we, the top speed points have been exhausted is, uh, is question six around the Choosing Wisely Canada questions. For all the other questions, lots of top speed points remaining. Um, I wanted to mention that, that we do encourage all submissions, and this comes out of a, a number of questions we've had over the last couple of weeks from folks that have um, data sets that, that, that can speak to some of the questions, some, some portions of the question answered, but maybe don't exactly fit the letter of the question. Maybe their data set doesn't have the, the exact uh, set, of, uh, set of data required, um, um, or, or there's some, some aspect of the question that they can't quite comply with. And what I, what I want to uh, stress to folks is, is please, we'd encourage you to submit regardless. Um, we're realizing that there's lots of different ways that people can use their data sets to provide really relevant information and inform the policy discussion. And, and of course, all of the submissions will go into the hands of our judges to determine who's really making the, the, the best contribution. So, so all submissions are certainly encouraged. Uh, our challenge uh, ha has been live since May 12th and closes on, uh, on July 15th. So we're about halfway through. That means there's uh, about four weeks left, so plenty of time for, uh, for folks to, to, to register and make submissions, and we encourage you to do that. Um, the, the awards process, just to give you a quick sense of what that looks like, uh, awards will be around the, the late summer or fall time frame. Um, of course, after the close of the challenge, we'll go into the judging cycle. Uh, each submission will be judged by a number of judges to make sure that, that we've, got a, we've got a good diversity of, uh, of input and we're, we're selecting the, the, the very best uh, uh, for the awards. And then once that, that uh, process closes, we will actually announce those awards. So the last thing I'll say before before handing it over for our guests, is that we really want your feedback. So uh, we're very happy to answer your questions on this call, but we'd also love to hear your feedback. So what about this challenging has been interesting for you or your organizations thus far? What are some of the challenges you're facing thus far? We'd love to see some of that early feedback. Now, we'll be asking you for more feedback as the, as the challenge continues and, and closes, but love to get sort of an early sense of that now. So as, uh, as our special guest is, is, is going through her presentation, encourage you to enter some of those questions you have for us and your feedback uh, as, as you've been instructed in the window there, um, and, and then we will, uh, we will speak to those at the, end, uh, at the end of the presentation. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome our, our guest, Kira Pendrith. Um, we, uh, we thought it might be interesting for folks to, to get a bit of an example of what some relevant analysis in this space looks like. Uh, Kira has been doing some, some excellent work with Choosing Wisely Canada to try and get a sense of what is some, some of the baseline for, for, for some of those Choosing Wisely Canada recommendations, similar to the ones that are part of our question six. Uh, and this is a, a presentation that, that, that she shared before with some colleagues at CIHI, and, and we thought it would be an excellent, uh, an excellent presentation to share with all of you. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kira Pendrith. Uh, Kira, take it away. Thank you, Simon. Um, and thank you, everyone, for having me today. Um, just in case people aren't that familiar with Choosing Wisely Canada, um, Choosing Wisely was a, is a campaign that originally started in the United States in 2012 with the goal of engaging conversations between patients and physicians about low-value care. So one of the key elements of the Choosing Wisely campaign are the top five lists of tests, treatments, and procedures that might be unnecessary or unsupported by the evidence. Um, and Choosing Wisely has spread to now 16 countries, including Canada, um, and we launched our campaign in April 2014. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about um, baseline utilization rates of one of the Choosing Wisely recommendations um, that comes up on a number of different specialty society lists which is to avoid routine preoperative testing before low-risk surgeries. So I'll take you through the methodology um, results and the limitations and conclusions that we found with our project. Uh, so routine preoperative testing is an item that appears on both the surgeons, um, cardiologists, internal medicine, and pathologists um, top five list, as well as a recommendation that was included in the American College of Cardiology's um, guidelines on preoperative cardiovascular evaluation. Um, and routine testing in patients 
undergoing very low risk surgeries does not improve outcomes, uh, it doesn't change management, and will often lead to further unnecessary testing, um, surgery cancellation, and increased patient anxiety. Uh, and so the objectives of this uh, project were to assess baseline utilization rates in Ontario, as well as assessing temporal trends, regional and institutional variation, and identify possible predictors of receipt of preoperative testing. So we conducted our study using data from the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, um, using uh, following data sources, so the Canadian Institute for Health Information Discharge Abstract Database, which um, contains records of all inpatient hospitalizations, as well as the high high Safe Day Surgery Database. Uh, and we use these two databases to identify um, our low-risk surgeries. And our low-risk surgeries that were included in this project were um, developed by our colleagues in anesthesia who developed a very, very low-risk group of procedures. And most of these procedures are done in an outpatient setting. The majority of them are done under local anesthesia, not general anesthetic. Um, and they all represent, the basket of services represents uh, procedures that have extremely low cardiac risk, less than 1% risk of um, cardiovascular, adverse cardiovascular outcomes or death. And so things that we included were endoscopic procedures, so gastroscopies, colonoscopies, uh, ophthalmologic surgeries, which for the most part were cataract surgeries. And then the other group that we considered were low risk surgeries, which included things like orthopedic surgery, so knee arthroscopy, um, some general surgery procedures, um, so hernia repair, uh, as well as some gynecological surgery, so cystoscopy. And so we included any procedures that were in the DAD or SDS in Ontario um, between 2008, fiscal year 2008 and 2012. We excluded patients that were under the age of 18 that had incomplete demographic or procedure data. We also excluded patients that had procedures during an in existing inpatient admission. So we didn't want to include procedures that might be following up something more major. Uh, we also excluded any procedures that were done secondary to a higher risk procedure. So for example, uh, a patient might have a colonoscopy before a colon resection. Uh, and so we really wanted to exclude any procedures that might be associated with higher risk. Uh, and finally, we excluded any procedures done at hospitals with less than 500 procedures um, so that when we were comparing institutional rates, we wouldn't be comparing a small hospital that had very low numbers. As we collected information on a number of patient um, covariates as well as a few institutional factors. Um, so patient demographics, age, sex, um, and neighborhood income quintile. Uh, we used administrative databases to assess whether or not patients had had a preoperative anesthesia consultation or a medical consultation, so with a cardiologist or an internist, in the 60 days before their surgery date. Um, we also used billing codes and uh, hospital discharge data to assess whether or not patients had a number of different comorbidities, which you see listed up here. Um, and then finally, we assessed whether or not the performing hospitals were academic teaching hospitals or community and what their procedure volume was. The outcomes that we looked at, we sort of categorized into cardiac testing and x-rays and then laboratory tests. And we used uh, Ontario Health Insurance Plan claims in the 60 days before the procedure date to assess whether or not patients had an electrocardiogram, an ECG, um, an echocardiogram, a stress test, chest x-ray. For the lab testing part, we our, main, our primary outcome was whether or not a patient had had any blood work, and we considered any blood work um, one or more of complete blood count, prothrombin time, partial thromboplastin time, or basic metabolic panel. Uh, so for our analyses, we looked at 
overall and procedure specific rates um, for the overall period as well as annually. Um, we looked at variation in unadjusted rates regionally across Ontario's uh, local health integration networks um, and then also at the institutional level. Uh, and then for ECGs, chest x-rays, and blood work, we developed multi-level um, random intercept logistic regression models to assess the adjusted um, effect of various patient and institutional factors. Um, we assessed institutional variation in our adjusted analyses um, using the median odds ratio. And if anyone's unfamiliar with that, the median odds ratio compares the adjusted odds of preoperative testing for two patients with same clinical covariates at two randomly selected institutions. Um, it can be interpreted as the median value of these odds ratios, and it always it's directly comparable to fixed effects odds ratios. So just for an example, a medium odds ratio of 1.5 suggests a 50% adjusted higher odds of receiving a preoperative test if the same patient had surgery at one randomly selected hospital compared to another. Um, and so here's our study sample. We had 1.5 million patients. Um, and patients, some patients had multiple procedures because this was a per procedure analysis. Um, over the five years, we had over 2 million procedures um, performed at 137 institutions. Um, and as you can see, the procedure volume actually decreased a little bit between 2008 and 2012. Uh, and just I'll briefly go over our demographics. Uh, endoscopy represented the largest um, procedure category with about 40% of procedures, um, followed by cataract surgeries, which are about 35 or 34%. Um, overall, our sample was 55% female with a mean age of 60, about 62 years, uh, although there were significant differences across um, different procedure types. As expected, the cataract surgery group was a lot older than the other two groups. Um, down here, this red circle um, highlights that almost 96% of procedures that we captured were done in an outpatient setting, which really speaks to how low risk these procedures were. Um, and then finally, I just want to highlight that just over 7% of procedures had a preoperative anesthesia consult. And about five and a half had a preoperative medical consult. And this slide shows um, a selection of the comorbidities that we included. So the cardiac comorbidity burden was quite, quite low, but 5.5% of patients had heart failure. Um, and more patients had asthma and COPD around 15, 16%. Um, and a lot of patients had cardiac risk factors with over 50% having hypertension. However, overall, the comorbidity burden was quite low, even while the proportion of patients that had a risk factor was higher. Uh, and so our results showed that just over 30% of patients had a preoperative electrocardiogram. Um, this was much higher for the low-risk surgery cohort than it was for endoscopy or cataract. So um, almost 55% of low-risk surgeries had a preoperative ECG, whereas about 15% of endoscopies had one. Uh, between 2008 and 2012, there was a bit of a decrease from about almost 35% down to 28% in the rate of preoperative testing. So the rate of preoperative echocardiograms was much lower at just under 3%, uh, and the temporal rate was pretty stable. Um, similarly, uh, similarly um, preoperative stress tests, there was only about 2% of patients that had testing, uh, and this again, this rate was stable. Um, and then finally, preoperative chest x-rays, about 11% of patients had a chest x-ray. Um, and again, like with the electrocardiograms, this was much higher. Um, 
in for the low risk surgery group compared to the other two groups. Uh, and so this next show, slide shows the um, regional variation in preoperative electrocardiograms across um, Ontario's lens. And so the black bars show the rate of preoperative ECGs in 2008 and then the green bars in 2012. So while there was there is still a quite a deal of regional variation in 2012, um, you can see comparing the black bars to the green bars that this variation did decrease quite substantially over the study period. And so this next slide here shows what we think is most interesting, and this is the institutional variation. Um, and as you can see, while the scales on the left side of each quadrant are different, the pattern that we're seeing is the same, and that there's a huge range in the institutional testing rate. So for ECGs, uh, testing goes from about 1 or 3% all the way up to about 90%. Um, for echocardiograms and stress tests, the range is not quite as high, but it still goes from about 0% to around 5 or 6%. And then for chest x-rays, the range goes from 0% all the way up to 51%. And so this next slide here shows some of our results from our logistic regression model. Um, so as you can see, age is a very strong predictor of testing. The older you are, the more likely you are to have a preoperative test. Um, Low-risk surgeries, as showed in the unadjusted results, were also more likely to have a low-risk test. Um, but what we thought was really interesting is that if you look at the comorbidity section, the effect sizes are quite small. Um, and what I included on this slide were the comorbidities with the greatest effect size, which was for atrial fibrillation with an odds ratio of 1.3. And then if you look down here, if a patient who had a preoperative consult, if it was an anesthesia consult, they were 8.7, their odds of testing were 8.7 times that of a patient who didn't have preoperative testing. And the rate for medical testing is similarly high. Um, and then finally at the bottom, the median odds ratio for ECGs is 2.4. So a patient with same clinical covariates at one institution compared to another was had a 2.4 time, or 2.4 times higher odds than if they had t their procedure at a different institution. Um, so we thought that this was really interesting that preoperative consultation and the performing institution uh, have a greater effect size than all of the meaningful clinical covariates. And then this next slide here is uh, shows our results for chest x-rays, uh, which are quite similar to what I showed you before for ECGs. The effect sizes are somewhat smaller, but you're seeing a similar pattern that preoperative consultation it has a higher effect size than clinical covariates, and the median odds ratio is still quite high. Um, and so now I'm going to move on to preoperative lab testing. Uh, so about 30% of patients had at least one lab test, and over 20% had two or more lab tests. The most frequent test was basic metabolic panel and then complete blood count. Uh, and interestingly, unlike in the cardiac testing section, um, ophthalmology, the cataract surgery group was mo most likely to have preoperative blood work compared to the low risk surgery group, which was more likely to have ECGs or chest x-rays. And then this slide here shows institutional variation in preoperative blood work, which is very similar to the curve that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, and the rate of testing goes from zero um, all the way to about 98%. So as you can see, there's a huge range in what's being done across the province. Um, and then this slide here, again, shows our res regression results from um, our blood work analyses. And while the clinical covariates had a larger effect size for this study than the ECGs and chest x-rays, um, preoperative medical consult still had a very large effect size, and the median odds ratio was, again, 2.4.
And so some limitations of our study is that because of the nature of administrative data, we don't have the clinical detail to assess whether or not these tests are actually appropriate. There could be clinical indications that would warrant these investigations. Um, furthermore, we are unable to capture any patients that had a preoperative test that would have, with an abnormal result, that would have led to the delay or cancellation of their surgery. We don't know what the outcomes of patients are. And then finally, um, Ontario's hospital labs are not um, reimbursed by OHIP, they're reimbursed by a global budget, so we were unable to capture any lab testing that's done in hospitals, so our rates are likely underestimated. And so some key takeaways that um, we found from this project is that rates of preoperative testing have decreased um, somewhat for ECGs um, in chest x-rays and blood testing, but they remain substantial across the province with about a third of patients receiving an electrocardiogram or um, at least one blood test. There's a large variation across um, local health integration networks as well as institutions. And finally, our regression results show that drivers of testing are old age, um, the type of procedure that you're having, whether or not you've had a preoperative consultation and the performing institution of your procedure. Uh, and from there, uh, if anyone has any questions, please let me know in the comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kira. I really, really appreciated that, and uh, I'm sure it was interesting for our uh, participants as well. Um, so just a few things before we take questions. One, to, just to say that that, that was a, a really fantastic in-depth uh, analysis, um, and, and not to scare people off, in the, uh, in the answer submission template, you'll find the line that you're making sum your submissions. You'll note that, that we're looking for um, a more simplified and concise, uh, concise analysis than that, but, but Kira, give you a really good sense of the sort of rich kind of analysis that can be done around some of these kinds of questions. Um, I want to spend just a moment or two uh, to, to point folks to the, the relevant resources for participation. As I said, there's plenty of time to get on board still. Um, so if you haven't registered yet, then by all means, uh, check for your el eligibility. Uh, you can register your team on the website and invite your team members. Look at the questions. And to, to, to participate, you just select a question you're interested in complete your analysis and enter it in the answer submission template and submit that template for judging. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can just email us at the innovation at employee-inforoot um, email address. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Fraser now who will uh, moderate the uh, questions and feedback review. Well, thank you both. That was uh, very enlightening and uh, lots of information there. So. Uh, as Simon said, um, and as Kira said, if you have questions specifically about her research analysis, please let us know. If you have questions about the challenge itself, let us know. And any feedback you've had on the challenge, uh, we'd also uh, like to know. Um, one of the first questions in, um, Simon, probably is directed more to you, and is InfoWay making any data sources available for the analysis um, of any of the answers to these questions? No, great, great question, and, um, and the, the answer is no, that the analysis uh, uh, needs to be done on data sets that are available to the participants. So we're really asking uh, for uh, organizations, for individuals from across the country that have data assets that can be leveraged to, to inform these policy decisions to, to dig deep into those data sets. So InfoWay um, uh, and our supporting organizations will, will not be providing the data sets for, for people to work on in this particular challenge. Okay. Kira, a question for you. Um, what process did you have to go through within your own organization to have access to the data that you were analyzing? Okay, so we, I, we at Choosing Wisely um, and Women's College are not, I'm personally not affiliated with the Institution for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. However, um, our evaluation lead at Choosing Wisely Canada is an ISIS scientist. So he put in an applied health research question, which had to go through their privacy um, approval system. Uh, and then that's sort of how that worked. I'm not hugely familiar with 
ISIS internal privacy, but um, could potentially point people in the right way of who to contact at ISIS to put in an applied health research question. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Simon, I know you've um, been privileged to some uh, feedback around the challenges themselves. I wonder if you just want to share that to maybe spark some uh, mm. other feedback that we might receive. Absolutely. Thanks, Fraser. So, so uh, part of the feedback that we've received over, the, over the, the first couple of weeks of the challenge is that there's wide variety of, uh, of organizational requirements. As, as Gary was just referencing in terms of abilities to ac access that, that data, we're, we're really interested in hearing about it, and certainly that's one of the, the purposes of the challenge is to, is to explore what are the opportunities to, uh, to do sort of more, more nimble approaches to, uh, to finding uh, quick answers to questions that, that uh, decision makers might have. Um, so absolutely part of the feedback is that this can be really tough uh, for some organizations to turn around and do this kind of analysis quickly, um, and, but that's all part of the challenge and part of what we're trying to explore here. Okay, great. Um, just in follow-up to uh, Kira's answer, um, Minnie Ho from ISIS has indicated that if anyone has any questions about how to access ISIS data or, or projects, uh, they want to do projects, feel free to contact her. So uh, thank you very much for that, Minnie. Um, our next question is, do we have to use the answer submission template or can we use our own format? So Simon, I think that will be one for you to answer. Certainly, thanks. So we would really encourage people to use the answer submission template. It's a, it's a very simple template. Uh, it's a Word doc, so it's quite flexible, so things like tables can be and, and, and charts can be inserted in there, uh, but we're really encouraging people to use that template uh, because it'll be easier for our judges uh, to, to assess quickly and to be able to, to compare across projects. So, so please do use the template. All righty. Um, on that note, can you maybe explain the judging process a bit then too? Mm -hmm, certainly. So uh, we've collected some judges from across the country um, and some, some fantastic folks that have uh, put their names forward. We've got um, folks that really bring that, that technical expertise, that really understand uh, data sets and data analysis. And we've got some other folks that have uh, some excellent policy and decision maker level expertise, folks that really understand um, what kind of information can inform, uh, inform decisions that are being made today in the healthcare system. Um, and of course, we have people that have expertise that goes across a number of the, the, uh, the, the, the technical or the, or the domain areas that these questions relate to, be that drug information or, or lab results or things like that. So what we're going to be doing is um, when the judging process uh, starts is assigning um, each submission to a, to a set of judges. So, so every submission will be judged by a number of judges. Um, they, they will, uh, they will, the judges will each independently review the submissions, score them, and then uh, return them to, to us at InfoWay. We'll collate all of those scores um, and uh, with, 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 with averaging the, uh, the judge responses and provide, uh, provide those average scores, which will be the, the basis of the, uh, the awards process. Okay. Kira, I may be putting you on the spot with this question, but given that your your presentation was so vast and as Simon sort of alluded to that um, in the challenge we're, we're not asking you to uh, for teams to go quite as deep, if you had to sort of in a nutshell encapsulate what you, you all your research, what would be those three key high points that you would think you'd want to submit as part of answering a challenge, the challenge questions? I mean, just simply looking at ECGs, I think, number one, that overall almost a third of procedures are having a preoperative ECG. Um, the second point would be that between 2008 and 2012, uh, the rate of preoperative ECGs has decreased by, well, the unadjusted rate has decreased by about 7%. And then the third would be that looking across the province at different institutions, uh, the proportion of preoperative testing at specific institutions ranges from 3 to about 89-90%. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Seems like Simon, you're the uh, the one that's getting all the questions here. Um, but um, if a data set that is available to me doesn't fit the requirements of the challenge question exactly, can my submission still receive an award? Uh, yes, and the answer is absolutely yes. 
Um, so we're recognizing that, that many of these questions uh, are, are, are absolutely challenging questions and that, and that for, for, for some of them there's, there might not be organizations that have the perfect data sets to answer them. And we're also recognizing that, that there's going to be a different different levels of ability to interpret and provide meaningful uh, meaningful analysis. So um, by all means, uh, if you don't have the perfect data to answer the question, please do uh, please do put that submission in and uh, the judges will, will decide uh, about the, about uh, the um, appropriateness of that answer with the judging criteria which are which are laid out in the rules. And I fully expect that there will be uh, awards that go to submissions where the data wasn't the exact perfect uh, perfect data to, to answer it, but that um, they provide a really uh, rich and meaningful answer that informs informs the the debate. Great. Okay. Uh, you're on the hot seat again. Um, Someone noted that on our website there was the option to ask an expert. Um, is that still an opportunity? I'm afraid uh, that the ask the expert uh, opportunity has has since expired. Um, so that that's an, that's an opportunity that's that's passed. Um, but do, we want to make sure that people do still send us questions that they have uh, to uh, to the innovation mailbox if they have questions relating to the challenge. So by all means, continue to submit those kind of questions. Okay. Um, Maybe this is for both of you um, because, uh, Kira, you're certainly doing some of this analytical work. And so a question has been posed around the detail that should be included in the response for the challenge. And should, like, raw data or calculations be submitted but as an appendix or any uh, sort of guidance around that? So maybe I'll jump in uh, first and Kira, if you have comments, uh, you can by all means add them. Um, so. Uh, the, the submission template uh, um, is fairly high level, but, but what we're seeing is that this, most submissions are kind of in the one to three page range, and that's, that's a great level of detail. It's about the level of detail that we had expected. Um, by no means there should there be uh, raw, raw data uh, included in, in the submissions. We're really looking for the uh, uh, cut to the chase, what's the answer uh, to the question that we've posed. Um, and if there's, uh, if there's tables or graphs or, or commentary that, that supports uh, the judges in understanding how you got to that answer, then uh, that, then by all means add that. Um, but uh, you know, I encourage you all to sort of in making those submissions. Um, you know, put yourselves in the in, in the mindset of a judge, or maybe the the the, the kind of a, the mindset you might be be going through if you're reading a journal article or something. You know, you want a concise analysis that really gets to the the heart of what's the question quickly, uh, and uh, and isn't too bogged down in the in the the, the, the nuts and bolts of the analysis. This is really about can we answer these questions, and can we uh, concisely tell the story? Uh, Kira, I don't know if you have if you have comments on that. Um, I think I would echo that, and only to add that I mean, the individual calculations might be getting a little lost in the weeds. Um, but when giving a rate or proportion, I mean, it's always useful to know what the sample size is, the denominator, so that you know what the volume is. But I, I think that's included in the answer template, isn't it? It is, absolutely, yeah. Okay. So um, so that's, that's all I have to add. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, well, um, we've had a lot of questions answered. Um, we seem to be on a pause at the moment, so I'm not sure if people are um, – have any more that they wish to submit or not, uh, please do so in the next little while, or uh, otherwise uh, we'll let you all go early. It is a nice day out there, as you noted, Fraser, so I'm sure people would be too upset about getting a bit of their lunch hour, <laughs> the, uh, their post-lunch hour back. All right. Um, well, thank you, Simon, for uh, giving us all of this information. Kira, excellent presentation, and I think you've set people off with um, a lot of uh, things to think about uh, so that um, they'll be able to enter the challenge and hopefully come up with a, a great uh, report for judges to look at. So on behalf of the... Uh, I'm seeing another question come in here from... Um, sorry, we're... Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, there's a question about the speed points, and so a question is: Have all of the uh, speed points 
uh, been given for question six. Is that right? And which questions have the most speed points remaining? Okay, so so uh, yes, that's correct. That the, the, the top speed points for question six uh, have been allocated. Um, there are uh, there are plenty of speed points available for all of the remaining questions, and lots for two, three, and four. Great. Okay, the, our sort of ring the bell got people prompted. Um, again, the question is, will the presentation be made via recording? Yes, it will be for sure. Um, it will be up on our website probably after the weekend, um, sometime early next week. And uh, you'll be emailed with the link once it's up for all those that participated. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to try this again and but please don't, if you've got more questions put them in now folks. Um Kira, thank you for your presentation. Simon, thank you. Thanks to the Infoway team that helped us uh put this together and I wish everyone a great weekend and get your submissions in. Thanks so much. And thank you again for joining us today. This concludes today's web conference and you may now disconnect. Have a wonderful day.